Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Virtual SMA Conference. This is Sarah from Cure SMA's Family Support Department. We thank you all so much for joining us for the newly diagnosed session here on the first day of the virtual conference week. We are so grateful to our national presenting sponsors, Biogen, Genentech, and Novartis Gene Therapies for their incredible support of this year's virtual SMA conference. Please note that all lines will remain muted during the webinar other than for the speakers. We would now like to introduce Kenneth Hobby, president of CureSMA. Kenneth? Thank you, and thank you all for joining us here today. Um, I'm going to kick things off for this session with an overview of the conference, but much more to try and show how the conference represents QSMA and how it represents our whole community. Everything kind of comes together in this conference, showing all of the work that, that we have going on, all of the progress that we're making, and how we come together as one community. So I'll try and give an overview of that in this session uh, for all of you newly diagnosed families, newly diagnosed individuals. So we can go to the next slide. To kick things off, I wanted to show how we've had changes in the SMA community. Um, and we've had very big changes happening. What we've gone through over the last few years uh, are hitting huge milestones for our community, for individual families, in what SMA used to be to what it is now. And these are huge changes where we've gone from SMA, what it was before 2017, where it was untreatable. There was really nothing you could do about SMA. We did the best we could to support each other, uh, as much information as possible, take care of the symptoms of SMA that we could see, but there was nothing that you could do to slow down what was happening with SMA, the damage that was being caused. It also used to be where the diagnosis for SMA was done very slowly. It used to take an awful long time with months, sometimes years to get a diagnosis, and it was done through looking for symptoms. Uh, and that's something to know that's very important right now when you talk about looking for symptoms, which means that damage is being caused and often irreversible damage to the nerve cells, to motor neurons. And that's something which we have now changed in a very significant way. So we've had big changes in the community. What we've also had going on are very rapid changes that since we've changed from SMA being untreatable um, to where we are now, We've also had a lot of things that are picking up pace. So we have, since 2017, um, we've had multiple treatment options that have been approved and are now available for us. We have three treatment options. We're also at a point now where we have over half of all individuals with SMA in the US who are on at least one form of treatment. And we're at a point now, right now, where Texas looks like they're just getting on board, where it's close to 85% of all births in the US that are getting screened for SMA at birth. And this is a pace that, that's picking up speed, if anything. It's not like we had kind of one big change and that's it. It's one change after another, quickly building big changes, quick changes happening for our community. And this is good. This is obviously what we are wanting. It's the progress that we want to see happening, changing the disease. So if we go to the next slide, I wanted to present the other side of all of this change as well. And so it's obviously all good. It's what we want to see happening. But what it means is that now there are choices for all of you to be making. Um, and these are choices which, again, are really good. It's good to have options, good choices. But we know that this isn't simple as well. And that's something we wanted to recognize. And we'll touch on a lot as we go through these sessions on how do you make these choices? Um, and so we'll go through a couple of options here and then provide more information, more kind of viewpoints on this. But obviously, we have multiple options of treatments. There's multiple options when it comes to the care of SMA that are available now. And so what we want to kind of highlight, especially up front here, is that these are personal decisions that you're going to be making, not on your own. The, one of the roles that we here SMA have always had is to make sure that we give you as much information as possible that's out there, give you all the information in an unbiased way for you to make these choices, make these decisions. We also do everything that we can to remove any barriers. We want these options to be available for everybody with SMA and remove barriers where we can so that you have all the options on the table in front of you, you have all the information that's available to you to make the right choice for yourselves. We don't look at this as a wrong or right choice that we're gonna be giving you. We give you the information and then it's personal decisions, personal choices that you're making that are supported by the whole community. It's something that the community's done very well even before treatments. We support personal decisions. 
There isn't judgment there. There isn't a push for one uh, choice, one decision, one treatment over another. So I think this is something which is good. We have multiple options. I think it's good to know as well that there's going to be more coming. It's going to get more complicated, if anything. It's a good thing, again, that we have multiple choices, multiple options now that we never had before, but it's not simple. One of the reasons why right now that it isn't simple in a way is that it isn't consistent for everybody. We're at a point of these rapid transitions where things are changing in the community. They're not changing at the same time for everybody. So people are going through different experiences, better experiences than they've been, but it's not the same for everybody. And that makes it more complicated as, as well. It's not just one pathway that everybody is going to follow with SMA. People are on their own routes, their own journeys through this. And so that does make it more complicated as well. I would say as well that this, this isn't something new for the community either that in the past, SMA was um, a situation where people came in with very different experiences with the types of SMA. We've had you know, the experience all the way from type zeros, type ones, very severe SMA, even at birth, to sometimes SMA can be an adult onset, type four. And so this is a very different experience that people have. It looks very different. But we as a community have always done a very good job in taking these different experiences how the disease looks in a very different way for different people, but making sure that we come together as one disease, one community. And this is very important for a lot of the, the progress that we've made as well. And so even now when people are gonna have different experiences of getting diagnosed, the treatment options that are gonna be available, the treatment outcomes that are gonna happen as well, we will, I think, be very good at staying together as a community. The other thing that we have going on is we have a lot of options, rapid changes, but we don't have complete information that's going to be available, complete data that's going to be available to make those choices, to be able to compare options. The, the field of SMA is moving so quickly in a way that the options are here now, but we need to catch up with the information that we're going to have available to help make the choices between those options. Um, and I think a way to look at this is we have the information that's come from clinical trials of the treatments. That is usually done for a very specific purpose. You do the clinical trials to get the information to get the treatment approved. And for that single treatment, the information that comes from clinical trials is not really there set up to be able to compare options, to be able to compare one treatment against another. And so that is what makes some of these choices difficult as well, that you're not dealing with a full set of information that's gonna get, make it very easy to compare one treatment choice and even some of the care choices against each other and for that we need more information we need something that you'll hear more about um, which is not just clinical trial information but real world evidence the other part with sma is with all of this going on a critical part for us and it's always been this way that time is critical that we're, we're talking with sma again about a disease where you're losing motor neurons, the nerve cells that, that get weaker and die off over time. And so it's very important as that's a very difficult thing to come back from that that often can be irreversible, the loss of those nerve cells to move as quickly as possible. And so while we have a lot of choices, information and, and decisions that we've got to be made and you've got to make these decisions, again, we're going to support you, but they're personal choices. One of the important things to always bear in mind is that that time part is critical to move as quickly as possible. So if we go to the next slide. Here I wanted to highlight again how this conference represents what the community is really about and what we Cure SMA are really about. It's a conference, it's a, an event uh, where we all come together as one community. And so we are an orphan, we're a rare disease SMA, but when we come together in one place, and usually this is every year where we get together here virtual, but next year back in person again, we come together in pretty large numbers and it can be really empowering. Um, it's a very good experience when you see so many people coming together as one community in one place. Um, and we're pretty big. We, we do get thousands of people that come together now. And so the strength in that, there's also, I think, strength when we see the different experiences that people are having. And we recognize again that you can look a little bit different in this community of what SMA is and what the experience, what the outcomes are, but we are one community and that diversity comes together and we're, we're strong and we have strength from that as well. The other part of that diversity as well is when we come together at the conference and we come together as a community, we're not just families, we're not just individuals impacted by SMA, 
We also make sure that we're bringing in researchers, clinicians, the healthcare professionals, industry groups as well. And this is one of kind of the key, this, the key things that's made us successful as a community. It's something that a lot of other disease communities copy now as well, that we've made sure that we bring in these other groups who are involved in SMA, but not directly affected into our community. They're part of our community. And that's what happens, especially at the conference. And it's one of the reasons that we've been able to be successful, that we've been able to grow our rare community by bringing these other groups in, welcoming them, making them part of, of what we are, making them really kind of motivated to, to be involved with us as a, as a community, being involved in, in the work that we're doing and moving us forward. The conference and the community as well has always been very optimistic. Um, Balance though with, with realistic goals, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later about what we've always been aiming for, um, how we've gone about reaching the ultimate goal of a cure in a stepwise realistic way. But it's always been very optimistic. There's a lot of hope, there's a lot of positive um, interactions, experiences that we have in the community. There's always been there even before treatments. And especially now with the changes, the outcomes that we're seeing and changing this disease and changing what SMA is um, in such a big way. We also try and focus um, at the conference, but also we're always making this balance that we're looking forward to the future. We're always looking to what we ultimately want to get, the hope that we have for the future for big breakthroughs balanced with today, what it is that we can do today. And there's always that balance going on that we try and make sure we're covering at the conference. If we go to the I wanted to highlight here why we've had some of the progress, some of the success that we've seen recently in SMA. Some of this comes from the basics of what SMA is, the genetics of SMA, and the way that we've gone about the research. So we have discovered and done really good research to figure out what causes SMA. We know the root cause is missing SMN1 gene. We've also done a lot of research to then identify that backup gene that's called SMN2 which is a big target for a lot of the drugs that have been approved and, and some that are still in development as well. So rather than just looking at symptoms, the muscle weakness of SMA, we've been able to do research and identify what specifically is causing it. And it's this genetic side that we've been able to discover, which has then allowed us to make the very powerful treatments that we've recently got approved. What SMA also is, um, and this balances to the side where I'm saying it can look very different, but it is a disease where it's the same genetics for everybody. And this is important as well, that we it's a discovery that we've been able to make with the research that we've done, where we can then say it's the same genetic disease for everybody. We can develop treatments that are gonna work for everybody, maybe in different ways, some different outcomes, but the same treatments for the same genetics for everybody that's affected by SMA. And that's important, that's something which we, uh, made sure has kept us as a community together as one community um, and it's been very important as we talk to industry groups the regulators FDA getting the treatments approved that we are one community it's SMA and it's the same for everybody so what this has done as well is one of the reasons for our success is the way that the community has worked it's not just the genetics uh, the medicine the science the research there um, the treatments that we've got approved it's how the community has worked together and it's been a community that's kept together with one voice. Again, the different experiences and we're, we're a rare orphan disease, but by staying together in a cohesive way, we've been able to speak with one clear voice to these external groups. And that's been something that's very important to, to move us forward. We've also as a community gone about, especially the clinical trials and getting treatments approved in the right way. Um, and this is going back a little bit now in time, but I think it's important to remember that we went about the research and the clinical trials to discover the causes, not just the symptoms. And then we did certain clinical trials with placebo control groups, people that were not actually getting a drug. They didn't know it at the time. And that was a way that we got really good information, good data that got us the treatments approved. Not easy to do, but we went about that in the right way. And it's why we're now getting the success and the progress that we're seeing. And again, this critical angle with SMA being an orphan rare disease, what's really been important is to bring other groups in, to not exclude people from joining as a, as a community, joining into what it is that we want to accomplish. We need researchers, we need industry groups, we need clinicians to come in and join us and bring their resources, their skills and their expertise into the, the battle against SMA as well. If we go to the next slide. A 
I'll highlight a few of the, the areas where we look at the progress that we've made, how it kind of stands out, and to then talk a little bit about some of the future goals that we have here as well. So this is our drug pipeline. This shows the three treatments that we do have now approved for SMA, starting with Spinraza back um, at the end of 2016, 2017, and then we have Zogensma that's approved, and then also more recently, Everisd. But we also have other drug programs, treatments that are in clinical trials. There's some of the programs there and even earlier stages before even clinical trials happen. We have a number of programs going on. We need that research um, and those clinical trials to continue. We need more treatments, more drugs, and we just have approved right now. If we go to the next slide. This slide highlights where we are with newborn screening for SMA. And this is something that we have as well, made really good progress on. We're at a point right now where with Texas coming on board as kind of one of the final big states for us in the US, we're up to about 85% of all births in the US getting screened for SMA. And this is important. This is one of those big changes where rather than waiting a long time, waiting for symptoms to show up, we can test at birth. So it's a very quick diagnosis, but the critical part is it's before symptoms are showing up. And so when we can test, screen, diagnose, before symptoms show up, before damage has been caused with the nerve cells, we can then make sure that we're getting the treatments in very quickly as well. That's the ultimate point of the newborn screening. It's not just for a quick diagnosis, but it's to move as quickly as possible from diagnosis to treatment. And that's happening as well. And so that's that's something that we want to see. Treatment's moving very quickly. And we're just starting this process and we're just getting information in, but it's around, and you can see on this slide that's on the right here, it's about 22 days on average to go from diagnosis to getting onto a treatment. And so it's all pretty much within a month of birth for somebody that does get screened, diagnosed, and onto treatment for SMA. And that's what we want to see. It's not the end of the road, and we'll talk about this a little bit for our goals that are coming next, but this is one of these critical um, breakthroughs that we've had to be able to get those treatments in so soon, so quickly. If we go to the next slide. We're building a network of hospitals around the country right now. And this is the area where we're focused on the additional information that we're gonna need to help us make the choices that we now have. And so this is what we're building to try to collect the information that's called that real world evidence. So we're building hospitals that are specialized SMA care centers across the country. We have about 19 of these right now. They're pediatric and adult centers spread across the country. Um, we're just starting though. So we have 19, but we do need to get up to about 50 to 60 of these hospitals around the country. And if you go to the next slide, this is where we're gonna be getting the information that we need to help us with the choices that we're going forward. So we wanna build that, that SMA care center network over time from where it is right now up to about 50 to 60 sites. But part of this is that's very important, I think, to remember is where we are right now is great progress, great breakthroughs, but we don't look at SMA as being cured yet. And I think one of the important things with that is SMA cure is not going to be a single thing. There isn't going to be a cure. It's going to come from multiple treatments. It's going to come from combining treatments with early diagnosis, combining treatments that work in different ways together. And importantly as well, combining treatments with care. It's actually the combination of all those things that is gonna give us the ultimate cure, but we're not there yet. And one of the ways that we've gone about the research, the trials, the treatments for SMA is doing this in incremental steps. We've laid this out that we're not just gonna get a cure right off the bat. We're gonna to have to move from changing SMA from what it normally was before treatments were available. And that's this natural history. Um, the, the arrow that you see here, where SMA untreated is just a disease that goes downhill, losing strength, losing function, sometimes very rapidly. That's what SMA is before treatments. What we wanted to do as a first step is just slow that progression down. And that is an improvement. Um, it's good that we are able to kind of change from just a very rapid to prog progression downhill to something moving more slowly. It's not the ultimate goal, of course, but that was a first step. We then wanted to go from just slowing the disease down to seeing, could we stop the disease in its track? Could we stop it from getting any worse, stop any further progression downhill? And this is one of these parts when you combine that, a treatment that could stop the disease from getting any worse, with trying to get treatments in as quickly as possible through newborn screening before any damage has happened. That gives you the chance to stop progression, but also prevent the disease from getting 
uh, symptoms to show up. And that's where we think we are now. We're at that point where we have treatments approved when you are looking at combining those with some of the care that we can do now as well. We're able to slow the disease down, potentially stop it as well. But that isn't the cure. Our ultimate goal is to make sure that that lasts for a long time. And we don't know that yet. We don't know how long the current treatments are going to be able to work. What we also are not able to really do yet is do a lot to restore lost function, to bring back strength, bring that back after it's been lost. And that's something that, again, we've got to do more work on um, to get to this reverse part. And that's what we really look at is the cure. So we're getting there, great progress. But it is a pathway that we've got to go on from slowing to stopping to reversing the disease. And we have more research and more care, more um, evidence to collect in that area before we're going to get to that ultimate part. If we go to the next slide. So some of the ways that we're looking to get to that point, more work, more research that we have to do. One thing that's out there is the combinations that we're talking about, and I'll get to the care next, but here we're talking about potential combinations of treatments, of the drug treatments. One of the ways to do this is to look at, is there a benefit to combine the currently approved treatments in some way? The three treatments that we have approved, does it make sense to combine those together? There's, there's some reasons that it might work. There's also some reasons why we don't know if that's going to give us a benefit. And we also have to watch that that's actually going to be safe to do as well. So the treatments that we have approved right now, they work on the genetics, the causes of SMA. That's very powerful. Again, that gives you the chance to really slow the disease down, potentially stop it as well. They all work in similar ways, though, that they work in, in different genetic causes, whether it's the missing gene, the backup gene, SMN2, but they all work in what's called an SMN-dependent way, where they're all trying to increase the amount of the protein that's missing, the SMN protein. And so does it make sense to actually combine these together? Do you need more of that protein when you combine two of these treatments together than you get just from one alone? Is it important to make sure that that's happening in different areas of the body at different times as well? And it could be, and that's something that we've got to find out, but we don't know that yet. And I think one of the key things as we do more research to find that out is, does a boost actually help? But also, is it safe to do it? There is a question of, can you go too far? Can you boost these genetic therapies so that you're boosting the SMN protein too much where it would be safe to do that? And then always, not just an SMA here with these treatments, but always when you're combining treatments, you have risks of those treatments interacting together and having side effects. And we, so we've got to pay attention to that and make sure that it's safe. The bigger area that we're really looking at for combinations is not just combining these treatments that we currently have that work in similar ways, but trying to get new treatments approved first that work in very different ways from the ones that we have now, and then combining those together. So combining treatments together that work in different ways we think is going to give you that chance for a better boost. And the real way to kind of look at this is combining treatments that we have now that work on what's called the SMN dependent approach, again, boosting that protein, with ways that work in other areas of the disease that aren't just about the genetics, the nerve cells, and that, that protein, but work in different areas that SMA affects the body. And in some ways, this is about kind of the things that happen later, the actual symptoms that you see, especially focus on the muscles, improving muscle strength, muscle, muscle function, where those nerve cells connect and, and work to actually trigger the muscles. Those are the areas that we're looking at now. Can we develop drugs that'll help in that area? And then can we combine those together? And I think this is what we're looking at is the chance to really give that boost of a restoring function, restoring strength, restoring the muscle part but they've got to be done in combination together. If you go to the next slide. The other part of a combination is not just treatments together, but how the treatments need to be supported by care. That's the real answer as well to, to the long-term approach that we're looking at. We want to make sure that these treatments work for a long time. We want to make sure that we're focused on keeping strength, building strength back if we need to as well. And the treatments need care to do that. There's work that needs to be done to leverage everything that we are uh, now correcting with the genetics and the causes of the disease. So things with physical therapy and nutrition, we're going to need to do those on top of the treatments to keep them going and especially to build back that strength. Um, we need information to do that. 
I think that's part of this care center network and where we are right now. We know we have to do this. We know it's going to be important, but we need the right information to tell us how to do physical therapy in the right way for SMA, for SMA where you have a treatment, nutrition and these other sites. We've got to get that right information so that we can have good guidelines out there on what to do. The other part I think we want to stress here just um, on this closing slide that I have is we have to pay attention still to SMA. Even though we are seeing very good results in a lot of areas, um, and especially when, again, we can get the treatment started very early, SMA isn't cured and it, it might be much better, but we have to pay attention to it. We can't take our focus off making sure that we're watching SMA, watching even for mild symptoms and taking care of these aspects of care as well. These are going to be important for us long term and we've got to pay attention to these. SMA isn't done, SMA isn't cured yet, and so we have to kind of watch and, and still pay attention. And ultimately, this will all build to what we hope is better information for all of you as well. That will make it those choices that you have now, which are great. It's great to have these options, but we'll try to help with the information to make those choices easier over time, not just on the treatments, but with care as well and what we're calling evidence based information based standards of care that we'll put out there. So with that, I wanted to hand over, I think Jess and Colleen are going to come on and talk a little bit more about the conference sessions that we have, the, the sessions and workshops that you'll see that will give you some more information on these topics that we just talked about. So thank you, Jess and Colleen. Hi, everyone. I'm Colleen McCarthy O'Toole, and thanks so much for joining us this week for our virtual conference. We can click to the next slide. So unfortunately, we had to cancel this year our live conference that was supposed to be in Austin, Texas. But we are so excited about offering everybody this week our virtual conference, which is going to be really exciting. We have a ton of different workshops and sessions and networking events available all week for you. We did want to mention, though, that we do offer scholarships to attend our live in-person conferences every year. And so all of you will be eligible for our conference next year to receive the scholarship. So all of your registration and three nights of your hotel will be covered next year for our conference, which we just um, announced last week is going to be in Disneyland on June 16th through 19th. We're really excited about it. It's going to be an incredible conference, and we hope you can all join us with the scholarship. And we will um, provide you all with that information in the coming months by email. Next slide. We also wanted to mention our Friday night community conference closing social, which is something really exciting. We've never done this before. On Friday evening at 6.30 p.m., we're going to 6.30 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be um, offering a Zoom social, and it's going to be kind of a closing celebration. Uh, you should all have received a conference t-shirt in the mail, so we're asking everyone to wear it if you have it. And you can post the pictures on social media as well, but it'll be a fun networking event with all of the researchers, the clinicians, and all of the SMA families um, to all join together at once. Next slide. Great. Thanks so much. So hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Clark, um, and I just wanted to touch on some of the, the support programs that CureSMA provides. Um, but first and foremost, uh, please know that CureSMA is here for you and your family in any way that we, we can be. Um, we offer a lot of support and resources that we can pro provide from our informational packets that we can overnight to parents. Um, we can also send out to relatives and friends. And then we have our care packages as well, which really is a, a large box of toys that we can um, that we send out, and it includes different items and ideas um, from other SMA parents. So if you haven't received either of those, um, please reach out and let us know, and we can get one out to you right away. And then we also offer a wagon program, and um, we send out a wagon to any family that's interested. Um, families love the wagons. They'll use them outside, um, around the house, and then they'll even take them to appointments as well sometimes. And then we have an equipment pool of items that um, includes um, equipment items that we can send out free of charge to families and we loan them out. So if there's any kind of equipment that you're looking for, um, please just connect with us and we'd be happy to put you in touch with our equipment pool. And then we have our one day mini conferences and we're actually just getting back to in person with those. Um, we just held two this past month and this is our Summit of Strength program. Um, there's 13 more happening the rest of the year. So please check our website for um, dates and locations to see if there's a city near you. Um, it's just, again, a half day mini conference where we've got some presentations and really a way to connect with other local families. 
And then um, many of our programs this past year, we had to turn virtual. So we have um, previous webinars available that you can watch on our YouTube channel. And then we also have a virtual community engagement section on our website that really lists any of the past um, webinars as well as any future virtual events that we'll be hosting. And then if you haven't already, be sure to connect with your local chapter. We have over 34 chapters throughout the US that really are there to support families on the local level and um, are run by families and, and friends. So again, a great resource um, to connect with other families locally. Um, during the past year, CARE-SMA created COVID support packages and assistance programs, and there's a lot of great PPE materials, wipes, sanitizers, um, and more, and you can request those through the CARE-SMA website. And we also have specific care, package that, care packages that we created for teens and adults, um, and there's a lot of great items specifically for teens and adults, and that can be requested as well through the CARE-SMA website. And then one last item um, is our primary care provider packets. And these are really designed for medical professionals and providers. Um, so if your primary care doctor, physical therapist, or another um, medical professional is interested in learning more about, um, care, about SMA, we can get one of those sent out to them right away. And again, if you have any questions at all, if there's ever anything that we can do, please always feel free to email us at family support at caresma.org. And now we would like to tra transition to our second portion of the newly diagnosed session. Um, we've invited three families to be a part of our families um, sharing their journey panel. And our first family that we have is Danny Sun. And Danny, if you wanna pop on. Perfect, hello. Um, Danny, thank you so much for sharing uh, your family's journey today. I'll pass it along to you. Thank you, thank you for having me. So my name is Danny Sun. Um, I live in southeastern Wisconsin with my husband Terrence and our two children, Ruby and Landon. So in June 2013, I found myself sitting in this same newly diagnosed session, just as you are um, today at our first SMA conference. Um, so much has changed since that time, but I just wanted to start by saying that you are not alone in your experience with SMA, although it can sometimes feel like that. Um, no matter how our diagnosis stories differ, we're all in this together. And even if this is the last place you wanted to end up when you were going through um, your diagnostic journey, we're um, just please know that there's so much good to come. I, I can tell you looking back on it now, there's so much more good in our lives than I imagined when we were um, sitting in, in your seat in 2013. So I'll back up a little bit and share um, a bit about our story. Uh, both Ruby and Landon were diagnosed with um, SMA in 2013. So Ruby was nearly two years old when um, we got her diagnosis. She had been walking for almost a year, uh, but never very far, and she fell often, she couldn't climb stairs, and although she was developing pretty typically in every other way, I just had a feeling that something wasn't right. So we brought it up to our pediatrician a couple times, and uh, finally we were referred to a physical therapist. And within a couple weeks of meeting with that physical therapist, she said, I think that you should um, meet with a pediatric, pediatric neurologist because it seems like something else is going on here. So it took us about four months to get into that appointment, but a week after that appointment, Ruby had labs done, and a week after that, um, we had her diagnosis. And it was right about that time that she um, stopped walking. So about six months later, um, after lots of discussion and soul searching, uh, we decided to have another child and we found out we were expecting our son, Landon. Uh, since we knew about the potential for SMA for him, we had some prenatal testing done when I was just 11 weeks along with him. And three weeks later, we got his um, test results back that he also would have SMA like his sister. So, 2013 was quite the year for our family, as you can imagine. Um, there have been lots of tough times and lots of challenges since that time. Illnesses and surgery, um, just watching them lose strength and milestones, um, and a calendar just jam-packed with medical appointments. <laughs> But on those tough days, I always remind myself of something I once read that always helps me. And it said, 
remember that your track record for getting through tough days so far is 100%. So you're doing all right. And I just remind myself of that. We try to take that approach in our family. Um, yes, I'll be honest and blunt. Some days and moments, they suck. Uh, there's just no way around that, but it's not every day. And after a little while, as time moves on, those days spread farther and farther apart. Um, and as Kenneth mentioned, everyone's journey with SMA is different. But there's a lot to be hopeful for and grateful for now. So uh, moving forward a bit, the early years of diagnosis uh, were especially hard, um, watching the kids get weaker and weaker. But they both started uh, treatment in 2017. They started with Spinraza, and we got to see them start to gain some strength back that they had lost. Uh, we started to breathe, breathe a little bit easier after that time. Uh, they're now on FRSD, and treatments have just changed everything in the SMA world. And we're just so fortunate to see those changes up close and personal, you know, right in our living room every day. So Ruby and Landon are now seven and 10. Landon is seven, Ruby's 10. They are just about to finish an entire school year, plus some, of virtual learning. This has been interesting. Um, Landon is one of the most chatty, friendliest little kids you will ever meet. Uh, he spends most of his days uh, chatting with his best friend Audrey on FaceTime and they play online games and they play pretend games together and they play instruments and it's just great to see. Um, his smile is huge and just lights up every room he's in, which you will see when you get to eventually meet him. Um, and he will happily spend hours teaching you about his favorite topics, which are Sonic the Hedgehog, Mickey Mouse, and Mario Brothers. Ruby's last year of elementary school is next year, which I am entirely in denial about. Um, she has a wonderful group of friends who she talks to and plays with often. Even during uh, the pandemic, they're watching those relationships grow and um, blossom it has just been wonderful. Her room is a mess, like a typical preteen. It's filled with slime creations and books and crafts. Um, she really enjoys riding her electric bike. She plays the violin. She loves BTS and all K-pop music <laughs> um, and the Harry Potter series. So they're just typical kids. They're happy, healthy kids, exactly as we always hoped they would be. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're starting out on this journey. You, none of us know what the future holds, but there's a lot more good than I imagined it would be. Um, so I have every confidence that next year we will all get to be in the same space, in the same room, and actually meeting one another at Disneyland. Um, so conference has been there many times before. And while our family is a huge Disney family, uh, Disneyland is no longer the happiest place on earth um, because Walt made it so. But really because almost every time we go, we are surrounded by all of you, our community that's become a family. Um, and I will get choked up talking about it because it's uh, this community has saved us in so many ways and are always there for us. Um, we couldn't have imagined it eight years ago, but now being with everyone at the Curiosity Conference is what makes us the happiest. Uh, so now we welcome you into this community and we just thank you for your time today. We hope it was helpful and we can't wait to connect more with you this week and in the future. And with that, I will pass it over to Amanda DeVay, who will share her story with you. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, so my name is Amanda. I live in Syracuse, New York. And my story um, with spinal muscular atrophy is very much different from that of Danny's. Um, so I have two boys. Uh, my oldest is named CJ, and he's three and a half years old. And he is not affected with SMA. Um, nobody in our family had ever been diagnosed with SMA before. Um, so it was not on our radar um, whatsoever. Um, and then when uh, CJ turned about two years old, we decided that we wanted to have another child. So um, CJ would have a brother to grow up, or sister to grow up with. And um, so I got pregnant and um, I had a very typical pregnancy. Um, we didn't have, I wasn't at high risk. Um, there weren't any red flags. There wasn't anything that stood out to be abnormal. Um, and 
we, um, I got ready to welcome my second son, Brayden, um, in the beginning of last year. Um, Brayden was born on January 9th of last year, 2020. And um, right at birth, we knew that something was a little bit different with Brayden. Um, he had severe type hypotonia. Um, and if you're not familiar with what that is, it means that he had absolutely no tone, no, um, no muscle strength. He was like a wet noodle. Um, so when he came out um, and he was handed to me, he was very, very floppy. Um, so we knew something was a little bit off because I remembered when we had, you know, my other son, CJ, um, he was very stiff and rigid. And he also had a very, very weak, faint cry. Um, so they kind of fast tracked um, doing some tests in the hospital to see if we could determine um, what was causing Braden's hypotonia. Um, and they weren't able, everything looked normal, everything was, you know, typical, there wasn't anything that stood out. So they told us, you know, to go home, we went home next day, normal timeline, said so follow up with your pediatrician. And, you know, you might just find out what's going on with Braden um, when you get your newborn screening results. So luckily here in New York State, we are one of the states that does test um, for spinal muscular atrophy at newborn screening. Um, so we brought Brayden home and, um, you know, obviously there was that nagging feeling that, you know, something was a little bit different with him. Um, but, you know, we just went along the next few days. We went to our pediatrician, um, followed up with him. He said, you know, let's wait for those newborn screening results, see what, what you know, they have to say. And at six days old, we did get the phone call from our pediatrician's office that my husband and I um, should come in to meet with him. Um, so we knew at that time that um, he had tested positive for something. Um, so when we went in to meet him that night, he did let us know that Braden's genetic results did show that he had spinal muscular atrophy type one. Um, he only had two backup copies of SMN2, which was why he did have severe hypotonia um, and explained SMA to us and let us know that we really needed to move very quickly um, to try to get treatment you know, for him. Um, explained at the time there were two treatment options available and told us to really think over, you know, how we wanted to move forward as far as um, securing one of those treatment options for him. Um, so we did meet with his pediatric neurologist the very next day. Um, and we went over those options and we decided that we wanted to try to move forward with Zolgensma, the gene therapy, and, you know, do so as quickly as possible since he was already presenting symptoms at that time. Um, it was a fight. Um, it was a struggle to try to get Braden added to my insurance at work as quickly as possible. Um, very many phone calls back and forth between the insurance company and my employer. Um, probably called them about 20 times a day, um, but at 22 days old, um, we were able to dose Braden with Zolgensma. He was the very first child here at um, Upstate Galisano Hospital in Syracuse to ever be dosed with Zolgensma, so he did make history that day. And um, life has just been a whirlwind ever since. Um, we were able to, when he was dosed with Zolgensma, we were able to preserve his swallow and his suck. So he is still at 15 months old, 100% orally fed. He's never had an NG tube, never had a G tube. Um, so he is, you know, 100% orally fed. Um, we have been able to work on gaining some of that strength and that tone back. Um, over the next six months, we met with tons of different um, specialists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, neurologists. Um, he has physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, we've really worked to try to preserve, um, you know, as much strength as we can. And um, he's made so many advancements um, over those next six months after being dosed with Zolgensma. Um, he does wear BiPAP at night to help, um, for comfort, to help, you know, get a better night's rest. And we try to follow the protocols, even though Brayden is, you know, very, you know, strong for a type one. Um, so we can try to keep them as healthy as possible. Um, after those next six months past dosing, um, we did have an opportunity to try to get Braden enrolled in the early access program for what was Ristaplam at the time. It's now FDA approved as Evristi. Um, and so we did start Evristi with him at six months old. So he's also one of the first um, kids to really be able to have that dual therapy and trying to track his progress. And since we did start Everesty, um, his gains have just been incredible. Um, 
as you can see in some of the pictures, he has gained a lot of his strength and endurance back. He has wonderful head control. Um, he's working on being able to sit up independently. He can roll. Um, he can feed himself. He eats, you know, mainly puree, soft table foods. He can, you know, feed himself. He has full use of his hands, um, working on being able to wheel himself in his wheelchair. Um, so it's just incredible how much strength um, he's really regained over the last um, 15 months. He's now 15 months old. Um, and it's just been an incredible journey. And um, I'd be lying if I said there weren't some tough days. You know, sometimes when you see your child get frustrated with things that he wants to do, um, you know, we, we try to curb those the best we can. And he, he tries to be very independent. Um, he's my little firecracker, as I say. Um, he's got a very big personality for a little guy. Um, but he's just, he's really inspired me um, in so many ways. And just watching him grow um, and overcome all these obstacles the last 15 months, um, it's just been amazing. And, um, you know, being a part of the SMA community and seeing so many different families that have been affected, um, you know, differently in different ways with SMA. We're very fortunate that, um, especially with him having symptoms, that they did catch his diagnosis so early through newborn screening. Um, so, um, you know, big advocate of that. And um, yeah, and he loves playing with his his big brother, as you can see, he loves going outside, going for walks. Um, he loves to color. Um, he loves his physical therapy because he gets um, soft tissue massage. So that's something he always looks forward to. And big brother goes along with him and gets to play. So um, pandemic this past year has definitely made things a little difficult. Most of our therapies up until a couple months ago were done virtually. So. I kind of filled that void of being mom and, you know, caregiver and nurse and physical therapist, but it's helped me learn a lot really quickly. Um, and it's helped me really be able to advocate for, you know, Brayden and what he needs. Um, and it's a great journey and I'm really excited to see, you know, him continue to progress and, you know, where um, being a part of the SMA community continues to take us. So um, just hang in there. Um, you know, I'm always here if anybody ever has any questions and I'm happy Happy to help in any way that I can. Um, so that being said, um, I am now going to introduce our next um, panelist, and that's Al Friedman. Thank you very much, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing your family story, and wonderful to see you too, Danny. My name is Al Friedman. I'm coming to you live from picturesque Westchester, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia. Uh, many years ago, back in 1995, I found myself in the same situation that you're now in, uh, with my son Jack being diagnosed with SMA. Jack was diagnosed at the age of six months, and I came to my first Cure SMA conference, then called Families of SMA, um, a few months later. And I was really scared. I was really overwhelmed. I was really exhausted. I didn't even want to register when I came to the table. I thought maybe if I don't check in here, this won't be happening. Um, this is obviously a club none of us chose to join. And as soon as our child receives a diagnosis, we find ourselves kind of launched, launched into a twilight zone that, that most other people can't relate to. And we can feel very uh, alone because very few people can really relate to our experience of having a child with SMA. Uh, especially with a new diagnosis. So I'm really glad you've joined us today um, because you are now among people who really uh, do understand. Um, there is, after all these years, so much more hope for our babies and our children with three approved treatments. And those of us who've been involved for as many years as I have are very, very proud of the progress that's been made and the benefits that have come to so many other children. Uh, my son, Jack, is now receiving uh, at RISD, one of the, the three approved treatments, and it's gotten him a little stronger. And we feel very, very grateful for that. Uh, in the uh, photograph on the right, by the way, is my daughter, Kara, who came to our family uh, at, at four months old from Korea, and she's now a 21-year-old young woman and finished her third year of college and, and a wonderful sister uh, to Jack. Um, it was... Um, 37 years ago, I believe, this organization was founded by other parents like us. And when Jack was diagnosed as a baby, I placed my first call to Cure SMA, believe it or not, from a paid telephone. It was that long ago. And the uh, mom who answered the phone um, 
told me three things that, that stuck with me all these years. One, that I wouldn't be alone, um, that I wasn't alone, and that uh, Cure SMA would always be here to help us. And she told me a third thing, which confused me that day, which she said, now your baby is a very special gift. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out what she meant by a special gift, because there was so many challenges, so many doctors and hospital visits and wheelchairs and a long list of medical adventures we've been through, uh, especially early on. But uh, I figured out all these years later that she was right, that our kids really are special gifts. And you're going to discover that with your child as well. Um, our kids possess some very special gifts. They, they teach others uh, and they teach us about what's really important. We know the difference between what's important and what's not important because of our SMA kids. We meet some wonderful people open-hearted, compassionate people are drawn to our kids. They're, our kids have the gift of being magnets for wonderful people. And our kids bring out the best in everybody whose path they, they cross. Uh, so now I understand all these years later what that mom meant about our baby being a gift. And our kids also teach us that we can't do everything ourselves. Our kids teach us how to accept support from other people. Uh, and your child will lead you to some really special people, healthcare professionals and, and people like Kenneth and Colleen and Dr. Schroth and Dr. Graham, who you're going to be meeting soon. So many others who are experts in their fields uh, and many who volunteer their time and devote their lives to help families like ours. Um, and we're really, really lucky to have so many people helping us and helping our kids because it's too much for us to do ourselves. Uh, so I, I wish you well on your journey. And please know that there are many, many of us, parents uh, like Danny and Amanda and I, and many, many other families and adults with SMA who are willing to help you and are available to support you uh, along the way. I benefited from the, the generosity of spirit of so many other people when Jack was a baby and I was so scared. Uh, next year, as Colleen said, we'll be able to be together in person, which is a very special opportunity and look forward to that. We miss our big family reunion. That's what it feels like to us who've been a part of it for a long time. Um, and I, I wish you well with this week and enjoy the conference. And one, one small piece of advice is you're gonna hear a lot of information from a lot of different people and you might feel a little overwhelmed. Um, it's important for you to know that each of our kids with SMA is very different from each other. And you can see that just in our three presentations today. Um, every child is different and, and you shouldn't feel like you need to do everything all at once. Um, I did, I felt like if I didn't do everything I heard back in that conference in 1996, that I wasn't being the best dad for Jack. Um, but what I've learned is to pick and choose to listen, but to pick and choose what feels important at the time for your child. And we can only do one thing at a time. And it's also really important for us to spend time with our kids while we're learning about SMA. I was so hungry for information that I realized that I, I needed to be a good dad also by being with Jack and just being with him and having fun with him. Um, so enjoy your children. It's a lot, we know that, um, and we're here to help you. Cure SMA is here to help you. And we're thankful that you've joined us um, for the conference this week. I wish you well. Thank you so much for including us and uh, enjoy the conference. And I'm gonna turn this back over to Jessica. And thank you, Jessica, Colleen and Kenneth for uh, the opportunity to share our stories. Great, thank you so much, Al. And, and thank you really to all of our um, panelists, Al, Amanda, and Danny for, for being on today and for sharing your journey with everyone here um, today. We really appreciate it. Um, so for the next portion, we have actually split um, the next section of the newly diagnosed program, the understanding treatment, trials, and care section into two separate tracks, uh, one for families diagnosed pre-symptomatically and one for families and individuals diagnosed um, through showing symptoms. So if you actually head back to the newly diagnosed program agenda page, which is how you entered this first session um, and select the track that best fits you and your family, you can learn more about the clinical cares, treatment and care, treatment and care from Dr. Graham and Dr. Shroth. Thanks so much, everyone.